So how many of you in this room would consider yourself a leader? Just give me a show of hands. Okay. That's good. It's about what I expected. Maybe a little less than half. Um, probably the minority in the room. I find that a lot of people don't see themselves as leader. It's often the minority that does. And the reason of that might be that we have this idea of leadership, that it's authority, it's a position. And um, it's something that I think a lot of us struggle with seeing ourselves in that position. But I want to introduce you to one of the most influential leaders in my life. That beauty there in the center is my Aunt Gisela. She stands four foot nine. She might argue that, but it's, I think it's four foot nine. And she is one of the most influential leaders in my life. She has been mostly blind her whole life. She has never held a political position. She has never been a CEO. I don't even know if she's ever led a team or managed anything, but I know that she changes everybody that comes into her life. I know that she has guided me. She has taught me. She has left me with every conversation, hearing me, and then guiding me towards something better. She's a giant of a leader, really. And the truth is, is that everybody influences somebody, and everybody is a leader, because leadership is influence. Leadership is influencing someone to be more, to be better, to something bigger. Everything starts with someone influencing others. So as a church, we have realized this. Um, I've been on staff for about seven years, and I came on the leadership team at our church at a time when I would say we were maybe having a crisis regarding leadership because we realized that to reach people as we wanted to, we felt called, we knew we were called to make disciples of Christ, to impact people for Christ, to give them this hope we knew that would change their life, but we kept hitting this wall of being able to reach more. And it really came down to is that people often didn't see themselves in that role with us of being leaders and influencing people. And my lead pastor, Ed Wilgus, was trying to figure this out. So he brought a team together, and we knew that leadership didn't happen organically. We thought, I guess, I guess the church thought it would happen. We're like, go be leaders. <laughs> and then people didn't. <laughs> but, um, but we knew we had to figure out how do we get people there? How do we get them to see themselves as influencers of others, to feel confident in that, and to build each other up? And really, I like to look at it as a garden, this is always my favorite picture of this, is that God plants seeds and every individual um, is this beautiful seed that has the potential of growing into this beautiful person they're intended to be with God and, and blew it blossom in faith. And, but it takes nurturing and God gave us the role to nurture and to love each other. And as a gardener, you can only nurture so much with just your two hands. And if this world that we live in right here in our area in Douglas County is a big garden, if there's just a few people who give that position as the gardeners, you're only going to be able to tend so much of it. And we all have a piece of that garden to tend, to be effective, to reach as many people as possible. And this is actually the design of the church, by God's own word, by his own design. He did not give pastors and the people that were put in positions as church, at church leadership to be the ones who do the work to minister to everybody. That's a, that's a man-made idea. I think that's an epidemic of the church locally and globally in this last century that we've seen pastors and people in positions of authority as the ones who really are equipped and educated enough to grow people. That's not true. God actually gave people the gifts of shepherding, the gifts of equipping, the gifts, gifts of evangelism so they could build up the rest of the body of Christ to go out and do that work so that we could have exponential impact and tend our piece of the garden. But like I said, it wasn't happen organic. We don't have an organic garden. We needed some pesticides and chemicals. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we didn't have an organic garden. So our leadership team that Ed put together got together for two years. We wrestled with this. How do we get people to see themselves as leaders? How do we get them to grow in that? And we came up, after spending time with other churches who are struggling with the same thing, we came up with a leadership pathway, as we called it. At least we could identify those steps of leadership and try to identify how we can encourage and equip people to feel confident in that. And there's a starting point, and then there's a relational leader, and that's anybody who's leading some, another person in a relationship. This is parenting. This is with your spouse. This is... Um, discipling and encouraging another person. My husband's giving me the signal to breathe. <laughs> you know, I speak out loud if I see something, I don't think. Um, so I guess I need to breathe. Let's all breathe together. In and out. Okay, beautiful. 
Um, and then there's the team leader. That's someone who is comfortable leading a team of people and developing them towards something more. And then there's the ministry leaders, we call it. And this is really someone who is leading other leaders of teams and, and developing them and equipping, equipping and influencing them to be better leaders and to continue that process. And then there's an organizational leader, which is not something everybody needs to be. It's someone that's gifted with capabilities and capacity to lead an organization and influence it and all the moving parts and leaders in it. And then there was this aha moment for me in this process, which was, I called it the starting point, but it was self-leader. At first I was like, this is something our team unraveled together. And I was like, is that really a thing? I mean, everything we know about leadership is if, if you're going somewhere and nobody's following you, you're not a leader, you're just a guy or a girl taking a walk, right? So is self-leadership something? But as I started to think about it and realize that leadership was really influence, I thought, who do we have the most influence over? Who has the most influence over us? Who do we have the most arguments with? It's not our spouse or our kids, it's us, it's in our head. We have ridiculous control and ridiculous um, presence with ourselves. We're the ones who are, are really affecting each other, are affecting ourselves more than anybody else. And learning to lead ourselves well, learning to have control over ourselves, and to lead ourselves towards growth is ground zero of leadership. I like to call it ground zero because I thought of it as a starting point. When I shared this with members of my team who are all guys, they really um, gravitated to like it's the blast site. <laughs> of, like, um, and I thought, well, that's, that's pretty good too because really a lot of times we grow out of crisis when our life blows up. And that's where we're forced to grow because everything is, is just torn apart and we gotta rebuild or, or nothing happens. But I think w whether it's ground zero of the crisis or it's ground zero because you're taking control Leadership, help leadership is the beginning of growing as a leader. I have to say, I have, um, I'm gonna share with you guys four what I call catalysts um, for growth. I don't have a nine point like fix it system, I'm sorry. I, I realize I don't know anybody well enough to give you like nine points of here you go, you're a better leader, because we're all complex and we have our own stories. But what I do feel like I can share with you is four elements of growing as a self leader, something that you can evaluate and apply to your life. But before I go into that, I have to warn you guys to have effective growth in what I'm gonna share with you, you have to have a couple things. You have to have grit. And grit is perseverance, because growing and leading yourself and really pressing into the things that need to maybe change is hard. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for you often and sometimes uncomfortable for others. You have to be perseverant and press through that uncomfortableness. And you have to have resolve, which is also grit. You have to have resolve that it, you're doing this because you know there's gonna be growth on the other side. And you also have to have grace. While we are the biggest influences of ourselves, we're also the biggest critics, I think. We're the voice in our head that's judging ourselves the most and not letting the past go. And to grow, you gotta let it go. You have to have grace with yourself and you have to realize that that is not who you're gonna be in the future. And to be honest, we're pretty fallible people. This might help us to accept each other better. We're all pretty fallible. We're all pretty faulty. And we need a grace that's bigger than us because we live in a broken world. And that's really the big grace that we need to do this journey successfully. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I believe this. I believe that we were designed to be in communion and connection with God. I, feel, I believe that we are lacking without that. And to really experience grace, we have to know that grace that brings us back to God. And that comes through Jesus Christ. That comes through believing that he died to reconcile this distance we had between us and him from the very beginning. And so if you, I believe you can take the principles that I'm gonna share today, and I think you can apply them, and you're gonna have some positive product, product out of it, but you will be a shell of who you were intended to be without God, and that comes through Jesus Christ. So the first thing I wanna share with you as a catalyst to self-leadership is self-awareness. It's very uh, closely tied to what I just talked about because in your spiritual life, to even start your spiritual life and be connected with God, you have to become aware that you are a sinner, that you are broken, that you need God, and that's missing. You accept Jesus and that starts that time and connection with God. In general though, self-awareness can be very, very helpful in growing. I had a friend who came from a very dysfunctional life. Um, she had an alcoholic stepfather who was abusive and just all around um, step siblings and it was a very difficult life. 
and she learned very early on that she did not want to repeat that life. So she started watching what she saw that didn't work and trying to adjust and make sure she didn't see that in herself. And she became naturally self-aware. When she was an early adult, she went to counseling because even though she tried really hard to be self-aware, she was still quite a mess, by her own words. Um, and she went to the counselor, and the counselor said, after sharing and talking with her, he said, the only thing that is holding you together is your incredible self-awareness. Without that, you would be completely insane right now. That's how, that's how valuable self-awareness is, if you can just see and adjust to what's going on. And self-awareness is seeing how you're affecting others, understanding how others are affecting you, and being able to adjust. And that's not as easy as it sounds. I think often we think we're more self-aware than we are, because it's hard to really press into, and that self-awareness is something that needs to grow, or leads to something, seeing into something that needs to grow. I think there's enemies working against us, too, to being self-aware. The first enemy is not having time to self-reflect. This is not something I see a lot in our culture. I think it is hard to get time to be with ourselves and to intentionally reflect on our day. I have another friend who's a very high-level leader in an organization here locally, and I was curious because she's a very effective mother, and she's a very um, supporting spouse, and she's very good at her job, which is very time-consuming. I thought, how do you keep it all together? How do you keep growing without exploding, <laughs> like I've seen so often, even in myself. And she talked about this process she started when she was uh, just a young teenager, where she would have a transition bath, as she called it every night. She comes home, she goes in the bathroom, locks herself in. Moms, we lock ourselves in, right, to the bathroom. <laughs> that might be your only hope for self-reflection. Um, but she would lock herself in, and she took take her time and do her process of getting her bath ready. And that was her process to let her mind just kind of reflect on the day and to kind of debrief. And she actually told me she only gets in the bath for like two or three minutes after this long process of getting ready for it, because that's not what it's about. Um, and she does it uh, on Friday nights as well. And reflects on her week and how she responded. That helps her to evaluate, like, am I responding well? What's really going on inside of me? And keeps her moving forward. The other enemy of self-reflection is isolation, which is the opposite of that. And that's not isolation so you can reflect. That's isolation when you're avoiding. It's easier than processing what's going on and what's not working. It's easier for me just to isolate and get away from those people or those situations that I don't like. And that's not going to help you. The situation is still gonna be there and you're gonna stump your growth. And you're also taking yourself away from the very important um, aspect of people's input into your life, whether it be the love and grace that helps us to grow or the reflection of the things that we need to change. We've, we've taken away that mirror that helps us to realize what, what are the things that aren't working here. And this one's my favorite because it's my favorite sin. Um, no, I'm just kidding. It's, it's my vice <laughs> when it comes to self-awareness because blame and justification is a really big one for when we see something in ourselves or a glimpse of it or something that's not working, often we react with defensiveness or blame or justification. I did that because I was trying to help instead of owning what you were doing. My husband is so generous with helping me see this, even though I don't even ask for it. Um, <laughs> he gave me a, a great uh, moment of glimpse into myself once when he shared with me that, you know, when you feel like you've hurt somebody or you've made it difficult for someone, you get defensive. And I was like, excuse me? <laughs> I really was. I was um, but after I, I let that simmer and chew, chewed on it for a while, I realized there was truth in that, that when I feel like I've done something rash or I haven't thought it through and I've caused someone discomfort or um, hurt or anything like that. I just hate it. So I want to like, I just get mad almost at myself, but it comes outward. I want to justify and say I was trying to help. And just last week I was in Disneyland, the happiest place on earth, <laughs> on my best behavior. And my daughter had just went on this ride called uh, Big Thunder Mountain. And it she went on it by herself, and she came off of it, and her first thing was like, that was awful, I got thrown around, and it hurt, and no, no one should ever go on that ride by themselves. So we were there with our really good family friends, and we went on it later that night all together. There were nine of us, and they threw us into the slots, and we didn't quite fit the numbers, and I saw that my friend's son, who's the same age as my daughter, was by himself, and I panicked. I'm like, he's going to be battered on this ride. I have to stop it. And so I started to try to organize and like say, we got to get him with somebody. <laughs> and I didn't ask questions. I just started like organizing. And then, and then he was trying to resist his mom. Her, her, his mom was like listening to me and, and there was this tension. And my husband leans over in his gracious way of sharing with me <laughs> and said, you're controlling the situation and you're causing frustration. And I was like, excuse me. I am saving this boy. Um, <laughs> no, I actually, 
I wanted to say that, but I took a breath and I turned around and I, I asked uh, my friend's son, do you want to ride by yourself? And he's like, yes, let me go. And apparently when you're a 13 year old boy, it's awesome to conquer a roller coaster by yourself and you don't care about the pain. I didn't know that, um, <laughs> but it's true. And I would love to say that I had that moment of my husband speaking some truth into my life and I was like, yes, you're right. But I, I didn't, I simmered that whole night. I was like, I was trying to help and you were just like judging me and, and then I'm wrestling with myself, I'm influencing myself and I'm like, you, I mean, it was, it was good, you were doing good. And, 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 and then I was like, you know, I didn't ask questions, I didn't ask other people's perspective, I just took over out of fear, my own misplaced fear. And once I finally owned that, there was a freedom. It's like, it wasn't a big deal. I, I kind of messed up, I made it uncomfortable for people, no one was mad at me, um, it was done. And I let it go instead of hanging on to it. It's a lot like repentance. Confess it, own it, let it go. When you try to justify it, when you try to get around it, you're still carrying it with you and you're really bound to repeat it. So let it go. The second part of this frame, catalyst for growing in self-leadership is perspective. While self-awareness is how we see ourselves, perspective is how we see others in the world around us. One of my favorite um, heroes of the faith is the Apostle Paul. He wrote almost half of the New Testament, but he started out a different way, as many of you might know. He started out bound to a religious system of the Jewish faith at the time. He was so focused on the law and following it and so zealous about it that he missed the very object of that law, which was Christ. He missed that the Messiah had come while he lived, and he to the point of after, after the Messiah was here and Jesus was here and resurrected and his followers were sharing the good news that he led the charge of killing them and trying to eradicate that because he was so focused on what he knew from his life and he wanted the law to be the rule. And it took the resurrected Christ appearing to him on a road to a place called Damascus and saying, Paul, look at, why do you persecute me? And that was what brought Paul clarity, self-awareness if you will, and changed his perspective. He became a believer in Jesus Christ, how could he not, at that moment. And you might think that he went off and started preaching and changing the world right there, but he didn't. Paul actually retreated to a very isolated place in the deserts of Arabia at that time. And I think a part of the reason is, is because even though he, he was now um, knew the truth, he had a lot to reconcile. He had a whole life of, of being bound to this law and so focused on it. And he had things he had done. There were emotions. And, you know, Jesus knows that this is what it's like for us. He walked as a man, as a human being on earth. He knows what it's like for us. And when we become believers, we start this process. It's called sanctification. And it's a big churchy word. I don't like to use those too much, but it's a really important one. And this is what Paul went through, and he, we all do. Once you become a believer in Jesus and you know the truth, you're spiritually alive, but you're still bound to this fleshly body. You're still bound and in this broken world. You've still lived the life that you've lived, and there's scars, and there's stuff that you're dealing with. And Christ begins to move you closer to what you're intended to be. At salvation, he, God sees you as beautiful. You're covered by Christ. You're no longer that sinner. I just hit my thing. <laughs> I got so passionate um, that he sees you that way, but you begin this process of him bringing you in this body on earth closer to that. And it's hard because we're wrestling. We have this new perspective. We know it's true. And we don't do it alone. We do it with God. But Paul, I think, went off and he had time of self-reflection. And I'm sure he had to have his perspective. And he had to wrestle with capturing these ways that he had thought before and letting God transform them. And that took time. And that was okay. And it was Paul's words that are recorded in the book of Philippians, which is a letter Paul wrote to the church of Philippi. I think it's really great that if you think of Paul's life, he wasn't some um, leader in one place that they called him a leader. He was an influencer. He wrote letters. He um, shared the word. He encouraged. Much like, I, I want to go back to my Aunt Gisela, or Aunt Gisela really quick. Um, she, she wrote letters most of my life before I really got to know her because she was blind. She couldn't travel. She wrote letters and she talked to me on the phone. That's all she had. And she changed my world because of that. And she prayed for me. And Paul, one of the guys that people of history that are right there underneath Jesus is one of the most influential people of our world. A lot of his influence was through writing and words and just spending time with people. I think that's important to note. But it was his words that I first learned after I became a believer. This is one of the first Bible verses that I learned. 
for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And when I became a believer, I was 15, and leading up to that, I did not see myself as a sinner. That wasn't my problem. I was, really was. But that wasn't what was heavy on me or understood. What I did know is hopelessness. I knew a lack of purpose. I, I felt unloved. I felt alone in this world. And when I became a believer, when I heard this, and I, after hearing it often and many times, I finally got it, and I realized that God loves me, and I accepted this gift, and I became alive spiritually. And all of a sudden, I knew this hope that I never thought I could even know. I couldn't have even imagined it until I knew it. And I knew this love had filled my soul and that it could never be taken away. And then I started seeing the world differently. I started seeing my mom who had a broken life as someone who could have this hope, who could be whole, that that could never be taken away from her even though the world had rejected her. I saw the kids at school who were the outcast, that they could be loved. Um, and it changed everything. No longer were people a means to an end or someone I needed to impress so I could have worth. I saw them as God's children, people he loved, that he wanted them to have that hope too. But my perspective changed and the way I treated people changed. And the same thing happened for the Apostle Paul. The people that were his enemies, the people that he judged, either the rule keepers or not, were now all those who needed grace. And that changed who he was, that changed how he acted, and that changed his story. And it's the same for us. If we see purpose in the right things, that will change how we live our lives. Do we live for the temporal things that make us happy for a moment and then cause pain? Or do we live for something greater? How do we see other people? Are they um, blockers of our goals? Or are they ob the object of everything that's important? Not beyond God, though. <laughs> but the, our people are important. So at the end of this book of Philippians, Paul gives an encouragement to the, the church there. And he says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He encourages them to keep their perspective on the right thing. Don't dwell on the things that are, aren't important. Don't dwell on the things that are negative and will bring bitterness. Dwell on what God has given you. Dwell on what the big purpose is. But it's important to note that the first thing he says is whatever is true. Because to be honest, this, isn't, this is absolutely the most important thing of this. To be honest about what I'm sharing tonight, the first two things I shared with you are not very valuable and they're very dangerous often if they're not within truth. You can have perspective that's not through the compass of truth and you can have self-awareness that has lies in it, that is not true, and it will be dangerous. It'll lead you to consequences. In our world, there is this common lie that if we believe something, that makes it true, especially when it comes to the things that we can't see or understand. But that is not true. So we know if we take a car and we believe with all of our hearts that it's going to go through the wall, if I drive into it, we all know it's going to hit the wall. There's going to be damage. There's no belief that we could have that would make it uproot the nature of physics. But we often think that if we believe things about God or the unseen, that it's going to make them true. But there is a truth. There is a God. The same God that designed the physics of the world created us. He created us in spirit and in body. And the truth is the truth. And how this has a negative effect on our perspective and our self-awareness is this. If we believe something is true, and we decide that's true, and we orientate ourselves to that, believing it's true, per se, if we believe that God is going to bless us if we're good, he's going to do good things if we're good, if that is the truth that we, we live our life by and we're really, really good because we want to be blessed, and then something bad happens. What happens to our perspective and our thought of ourself? We either think, well, God's not good, like he said he was. God lied to me because I believed something about him that wasn't true. Or I'll think, I wasn't good enough, so God's not blessing me. Well, the truth is that God promised us that he would love us, that he would work good in our life, that he would never leave us, that he would develop and pour out blessings of us in a spiritual nature of growing us in our faith, growing us in our perseverance. He actually said, as it comes to trials, that those will happen. He actually promised they will happen. He didn't say they wouldn't happen if you were good. He said they will happen, but through those I will be with you and I will develop you. Because God's an amazing leader. So if you have your truth not aligned with real truth, if your truth is false, 
and things start happening that don't line up with it, it will take your whole journey askew and your reality will be distorted and you will be stuck in the cycle of lies. So truth is important. How do we know truth? We know truth by knowing it. You can't know truth if you don't know it. You have to learn it. You have to be exposed to it. You have to seek it out. And I do come back to, I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is God. I believe in the Bible as the inspired word of God. And I believe that is the truth that will transform our life. I don't just believe it. I've lived it. I've seen it. I see it over and over again. That is why I work for the church. The benefits are not great. <laughs> no, they're, they're pretty good. We get pretty good. But, you know, it's, it's, it's good. I get wafers. Um, just kidding. But I be, that is what it, that is important, and truth is important. So you have to expose yourself to it, and you have to seek it. There's another thing that Paul says after this point in this same passage, in this letter to the Philippians. He says, after that, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. So it's not the only time this is stated in the Bible. If you know it, do it. Apply it. And that's the, the last part of this. You have to apply what you've learned. You have to apply what you're seeing. If you don't do that, you're going to become stagnant water. It might be more comfortable for the time being, but you're not going to grow. And sometimes part of, parts of you are going to start to rot because they're not growing. And it's harder when you're aware of them, too. That's where you get into that place where you're feeling the weight of it. It's like if you, if you become a believer and you know Jesus and you keep sinning, you feel that. You feel that. And, and there's a battle that is very hard. So you have to apply it. And I have another piece of wisdom from an, a prophet. Prophet's too strong of a word. I'll call him a theologian. His name is Father Cunningham. <laughs> That's not Jesus. That is my husband. Um, and this, this is stated in our house often. There is a difference between knowing and doing. It often comes after a teenager who's so wise, does something that they obviously knew they shouldn't, and they're corrected as they should be, and then comes the dreaded, I know. There's a difference between knowing and doing, because obviously you don't know to apply that. So there is a difference between knowing and doing. And so what now? We've had a little talk. I've shared with you what I have to offer. I've poured out my cup. What can you do? Well, I want to encourage you guys to go forward. First, with what I've come back to those points I told you in the beginning, with grit, press in. Take some time. Take inventory. Take time daily to self-reflect. And don't just, don't just throw that out the window when you're done. Look at what can, I, what can I see that I can change? What do I need to seek God's word in? What do I need to apply? And press into it, even when it's hard, even when it's not comfortable, even when you have to own up to something that kind of stinks. Do that so you can move forward. And do it with grace. No grace. Know that Jesus loves you. I'll tell you about the woman I told you in the beginning who went to the counselor, and he told her, you're basically barely holding it together. At least you have self-awareness. Well, she had self-awareness, but at that time in her life, she didn't have truth. And it wasn't until she found Jesus that she was able to start having true growth in her life. And it wasn't until after she was a believer for quite a long time, and she started really learning the word of God and what it meant to know the truth and not, not what she had made in her mind or applied, um, connected her mind to, but to know the real word of God and evaluate what lies she was believing in her life and then apply the truth to that and change is when she really experienced freedom and growth that has been amazing. And her name's Heather. You know her. She's Heather Jones. She's a life group um, assistant and our ministry development coordinator at Sutherland. And she's, she has amazing growth in her life because she keeps learning the truth. She champions a program we have called Friend to Friend, which is accessible to anybody who wants to. The whole thing is one person taking another person to the word of God and evaluating in their life, where am I believing a lie and what does the word of God really say and how do I live this out? And that's a leader influencing another leader, right? So go with grit and grace. Don't just take this and as another thing you heard one night, start evaluating your life if you're not already doing that. Start looking at the, the areas where you can seek truth and you can apply it. And I also want to share with you how important it is for us to have perspective from the outside. Remember, it took Paul having Jesus come straight in his face and say, I'm God. Um, and often in our own self-focus, self or just our perspective, we miss out on a lot of truth, and we can't see it until someone 
comes and says something to us. In my own life, um, I told you a little bit of how I started out. I was, I was a Jesus freak kid. I loved, you know, I was so passionate when I um, first knew him, and I went to Bible college, and I just wanted to give my life in service because I knew that he was the hope of the world, and he is. But when I reality hit, and I started trying to live that out, um, it wasn't working the way I thought it would. And there was a lot of discouragement, and there was a lot of trials. And I started believing stuff that wasn't true, and I started thinking, well, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe I'm not good enough to do this. Maybe that's just for those people, those leaders over there. Um, and I, I was on the verge of giving up, and in some ways, in most ways, I had. But it took somebody else here at Family Church getting to know me and saying, you know what? You need to get back in the game and being gentle with that and giving me little baby steps to serve beside them. And that was Pastor Will. Um, and you guys, I don't know, you might know him. He, he works here too. He's not quite at the same level as me, but he works here. Uh, <laughs> no, but it, it took Pastor Will. Um, he was my neighbor at the time and just a friend, him and his wife, Crystal. And it took him saying, get back in the game. And being patient with me in that, it's for me to even see myself as anybody who would make a difference anymore. And so maybe some of you guys need to hear that. Maybe you need to hear that you need to get back in the game. What I do know for certain is each one of you in this room, you're an influencer. You're a leader. There are people in your life that you have influence over. And you have the capability to have exponential influence, like my Aunt Gisela and the Apostle Paul, in loving people to be better by simply being who God made you to be and seeing yourself that way. Don't let that ceiling, don't let those untrue words that you can't make a difference, you're not a leader. You can lead as many people to be better people as you choose to. And it starts, though, with you feeling comfortable with yourself and being able to lead yourself in growth. So go with grit and grace. And I want to give you a tool to be able to kind of maybe have a framework if you need to start this. And in the back of this book I gave you, the first part was just for free-flowing notes. There's a 21-day simple, simple just reflection journal through the book of Philippians and some questions you can start practicing daily. I put the Word of God in there because I, I feel that is the compass of truth, but it's something you can apply every day to your life. How did I respond? You know, what, what can I apply to my life? What does the Word of God say about who I am? So I had to challenge you, whether it be through this tool or just making time yourself, take time to self-reflect every day and take time to read the Word of God so that you have truth to orientate your growth by. And I'm just going to pray for you guys right now um, as we close up. Dear Father God, I thank you so much um, that you did not give up on us, that you knew that we would um, live in a broken world, that we would choose sin, but you did not give up on us because you love us, that you created us in your image and you desperately wanted to restore us. And I thank you that you've done that for us who've chosen you. And I pray for those who don't know you, if there's any here tonight, Lord, that they will consider you, that they will speak to you, that they will ask and they will see, and they will receive you. And I pray for every woman in this room, Lord, the unique soul of each one of them. I pray that you will see, um, help them to see, Lord, where you're calling them to step forward to the next step of just trusting in you in being um, your influencer here on earth and loving the people around them. I pray for those who maybe are struggling with those negative um, burdens or those unhealed wounds, God. I ask that you will just give them a feeling of hope, grit and bravery to face in and trust that you will see them through the healing process. And I just pray for passion walking out of this room, that you'll give us passion for the true hope that is you, the true hope that is loving you and loving each other, and to help us to do that. In your precious name I pray, amen. Thank you guys.